HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost eighty grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. This show is designed to help small business owners, salespeople, and aspiring entrepreneurs master every aspect of business success. We've got a great lineup of guests and topics scheduled for you. We'll be talking about everything from sales to employee issues, from technology to social media, from work-life balance to exploring uncharted territory. Participation is welcome and encouraged. Your host, Diane Helbig, is a world-class author, speaker, and business development coach. Be sure to check out her latest book, Lemonade Stand Selling, on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. And now, on with the show. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we said, we welcome your input, so feel free to join the chat online Uh, You can type something into the chat room, and that will let me know you have something to share with our guest or a question to ask. Or if you're on the phone with us, you can press 1, and that will let us know that you have something to say. Today's show is sponsored by Win Cleveland and Vision 21. Win Cleveland is an organization that empowers female professionals by creating new access points for individual business development. They support one another by providing continual professional growth sharing a wide variety of ideas and resources, and assisting select women-based charities within their community. Visit www.wincleveland.org for more information. Vision 21 is an entrepreneur resource and development center that was created to assist established and aspiring entrepreneurs successfully launch and grow small business enterprises throughout Greater Cleveland. You can visit www.vision21.org for details, and 21 is spelled out there. My guest today is Kathleen Burns Kingsbury. Kathleen is a principal of KBK Wealth Connection and the author of Creating Wealth from the Inside Out Workbook. She is an internationally published author, speaker, certified professional coach with a master's degree in psychology, and an adjunct professor at the McCallum Graduate School of Business at Bentley University. As a wealth psychology expert, Kathleen is passionate about helping financial services professionals, entrepreneurs, and healthcare professionals navigate today's challenging business environment. Drawing on her experiences as a wealth coach and behavioral change specialist, Kathleen inspires, educates, and entertains with real-world stories, humor, practical tips and techniques, and unique insights. Hello, Kathleen. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm so excited that we could do this. And my first question for you to dive right in there is, if you could help us understand what a wealth psychology expert is and what you do to help business owners regarding fee setting and negotiations and that kind of thing. Sure. A wealth psychology expert is um, someone who specializes and has a background in psychology and specifically the psychology of money. So understanding how people think and feel and how that impacts how they behave financially. Um, I went into this field uh, a couple of years ago when I was 
um, having my own issues financially and negotiating fees and discovered that with my financial background and my psychology background that it was an area that um, not only did I really enjoy, that I found that I really excelled in helping uh, business owners in terms of their own what's called money mindsets. And a money mindset is how you think and believe about money, and that impacts you, especially if you are an entrepreneur or a business owner. Every time you set fees, you ask for a fee, or you're in a contract negotiation around a product or service, your thoughts and beliefs about money are in the room, whether you're aware of it or not. And so a wealth psychology expert like myself really helps somebody just tune into that and understand how does that help you, how does that get in the way, and how do you remove those obstacles so you can create uh, wealth and well-being in your life? Wow. And do we, I mean, I'm assuming, uh, not being a wealth psychologist, that, that our ideas about money come from our upbringing. Is that true? It is true. Uh, a large amount of it does come from how we were raised around money, and often because money is taboo in our society, it's more about what was not said and what we witnessed. Um, however, we're also impacted by the generation we grew up in, um, ah. the culture we grew up in, whether we grew up in the U.S. or not, uh, the religion or um, lack of religious practice in our lives, and you know, lastly, certainly um, any personal experiences that we've had around money that have either reinforced something or made something uh, shift in our own minds. So it, it's complicated, but it's fascinating, yeah. and I find people have a lot of fun when they start to tap into what they think and believe about money. Oh, that's so good to know they have fun with that. Because well, I have fun, money. so then I help them have fun, right? <laughs> that's really great. Good for you. It's wonderful. And it should be fun because, you know, I think it's sort of, I mean, what you were saying about, you know, um, especially in business, with fee structure and negotiating and, and all of the things that come into play with that, boy, you know, you have to be able to get ahead of it or get on top of it or, you know, in, in some way be able to do the things you need to do to be successful. So I'm all about fun. So speaking of that, um, what really is the key to a success, successful negotiation, really, to, to keep it light? Sure. I think with negotiation, often what business owners think is it has to be this battle, this warfare, and you have to win. Yeah. I think the key, and it certainly has happened in my own life, and I've seen it in my client's life, the key to successful negotiation is going into it as a dialogue to calmly discuss your perspective versus the person who's purchasing your services or products perspective and then come to um, you know a middle ground of what's going to work for me, what's going to work for you and then it's a much more pleasant experience and what I find is then people are happier, both the person who is the business owner, you know, getting paid and also the person paying the fee because there's been this dialogue and this understanding from the get-go which then helps you know, you avoid problems down the line um, where people are, you know, sometimes later uh, regretful of selling right. themselves too short or they're, you know, upset because they feel like they're paying too much or, or whatever it might be. Um, so really the bottom line, it's just a dialogue about money where you talk about what you need and the other person talks about what they need. So that's interesting for me because it sounds like um, maybe part of the reason that so many of us have trouble with it is because we – um, have preconceived ideas of how the conversation is going to go. And yes, so, a lot of us. Yep, definitely. Right. So, so um, because when you say a dialogue, and really, you know, that that um, connotes that you have to be listening to what the other person is saying, which means you have to be in the moment with it and not, you know, presuming how they're going to respond to what you have to say or how they're feeling about what you you have to say, and so you can be more open to really hearing where they're coming from and responding to that is that absolutely if you go into a negotiation you know you need to know yourself and you need to know your business and you need to know what you want and yeah. what your value add is but if you go in and you're you're prepped and you go into the meeting and you really spend most of your time trying to understand where the other person's coming from yeah. it is going to go much more smoothly and you are going to do a better job of helping them understand how you can benefit them. 
Um, and I find that when we become comfortable talking about money, which isn't so easy in this society, but when we do, <laughs> then negotiations become much more comfortable because we're not walking in feeling like, you know, we have to have, you know, all guns loaded and uh, be on right. the lookout for something, you know, somebody's, you know, going to win or um, bamboozle us. It's just a conversation. And it can be several conversations. I mean, some negotiations, you know, it's a lot more than just one meeting. Right. This is interesting because for me it's the same principle as when you sell that you should be listening more than you know you know your product you know the value of it but you really need to be listening to the other person in order to really understand where they're coming from and what they need so that you can respond effectively it sounds like it's the same policy the same philosophy Absolutely active listening is a huge part of it and also um really being able to um, listen in a way where you're not assuming what that other person's thinking. You know, we yeah. often assume um, if our fees in our mind are high that the other person's going to find our fees too high, when in <laughs> fact you're just reading their mind. They may actually find you the cheapest option. You don't yeah. know unless you explore that a little bit with them. Right, right, without going into it. So, and, and, um, so uh, it's funny because I had somebody say to me one day, they went over their proposal and said, um, you know, so what do you think? It's so it's a certain percentage of the, of the client's budget. And I my response to this person was, it's not about the client's budget. It's about the value of what you're going to give them, and is that a fair price? You know, that you don't start out the whole thing trying to figure out what's, what they're going to think in regards, you know, because that's sort of putting yourself in their head and saying, well, they're going to compare it to their budget and figure out what percentage of their budget is, without even asking them the question. Well, the interesting part about that is what I think is missing is, okay, you need to know kind of what their budget is and, and so some of that, but really what you're missing is, you know, they're going to spend 20% of their budget on something, so you yeah. have to really prove that your something, whatever that is, is worth that investment. And that's what it ah, is. Ah, that's a great investment. point. And what's the right. return on investment for that? Not just because, you know, you're a great person and you like this person, but that it actually is going to benefit them um, either personally or professionally to work with you and your company. Got it. Oh, great, 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 great point. Okay, so um, why is it so uncomfortable for business owners? What is it about it that makes it uncomfortable for us to talk about? I think it's uncomfortable because we don't have a lot of practice talking about money. Oh. You know, we grow up in a society that it's so taboo to to ask somebody their salary or to um, really be honest with your siblings or your parents about what you're what you're making, what you're spending, and so a lot of us grow up just not having these conversations around money. So it's really you know a lack of practice. And then if you go a little bit deeper. Money often ties into our self-worth, our sense of security in the world. You know, you need money to live. And so on top of it being something that's taboo that we don't talk about, don't have practice, it also is something that really ties closely to who we are in the world and our livelihood. And so you put those two things together, and that's quite a, quite a package to walk into the room with all this unconscious material going on and, and just knowing, most people just know, I really hate negotiation or I'm really nervous. But they yeah. haven't picked apart what are all these things that make it so uncomfortable for you. And once you figure the, out those things, then you can start to make adjustments. And lo and behold, some people actually end up enjoying negotiation. Really? Hard hard to believe. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite. <laughs> getting the emotion out of the whole thing okay so along the same lines though it 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 seems to me and i could be wrong about this and you'll correct me if i am but it seems to me that women have a harder time negotiating money than men do is that true it is true and i say that with a little bit of angst because it's unfortunate yeah. two things happen one is that you know research does support that women do ask less if you look across the board at uh, college graduates whether this is in the past or currently uh, women uh, tend to not ask or counteroffer when offered a job, whereas men will more often than not. 
And so what ends up happening over time is women actually are leaving so much money on the table that over the course of their career or their professional life, they're actually missing out on millions of dollars. That's what it eventually adds up to. Wow. Um, Yeah, it's really, really unfortunate. And what I tell women when I'm doing workshops specifically for women business owners is, you know what, it's not that we're not good at negotiation. It's that we haven't applied our negotiation skills to negotiating money. Because if you think about it, any listener right now who's a female can probably think about maybe one or two negotiations they've already had today with their family, their kids, a business partner. <laughs> Not that, you know, we're negotiating pickups from Johnny from soccer to who's going to buy the milk on the way home. We're negotiating all the time. We just don't think of ourselves as negotiators, and we need to kind of use those skills and apply them to negotiating money. And when we do women actually can be much better negotiators than men. Really? Yes, because we are good at building relationships in general. We're very good at listening and trying to understand where the other person is coming from. And when we're able to do those two things and be more comfortable with our relationship with money, we can be dynamite negotiators because we don't go in thinking we have to, like, shoot the other person, bag them, and bring them home to, like, win the negotiation, (laughs) which is just a more primitive male standpoint. Okay, so so, well, that's interesting. I mean, that's fascinating, actually, but I want to step on um, what you just said about. So when it comes to negotiating, if if men have this mindset, that sound what you just said sounds to me like men really do think about winning in negotiating. Is that where, where women want to win, but it's more about everybody win? You know, it's a win-win situation where everyone feels good about what they walk away with. Well, Is if you there actually, that difference? If, yeah, if you look at gender differences and how we are in the world and even our neuroscience, like our brains are different, men and women's brains, what ends up happening is women are wired for connection, and that's not only how we're socialized to be in relationship with people. Um, we are taught that when we interact with someone, it's about being inclusive. You know, oh, Susie, I love that shirt. I have one just like it. Um, our brains are actually more connected, the right and left hemisphere. So it, it's it's hardwired into us, and then we're socialized for that connection. Now, what that does for us as negotiators is it puts us in a tricky spot. It makes us really reliant on that other person and connecting with that other person, and if used properly, can make us a great negotiator. Whereas if you look at guys, their neuroscience, how they're socialized, it's all about competition. Their brains actually are larger than ours. That's okay. It's larger is not necessarily better. Um, But they're (laughs) less connected between right and left hemisphere. And what that means is a man can compartmentalize a little bit better. That's why they can go out in the soccer field and beat their buddy's team and then have a beer at the end of the day and there's no hard feelings. Whereas with a woman, the dynamic is often a little bit different. So in general, men compete and it's one up, one down, and women relate and it's all for one and one for all. And so it's just a different way of being. There are some exceptions to the rule. Certainly I don't right. fit every stereotype for a female in terms of these these gender differences, but it does make a difference in how we negotiate and whether we ask and, um, you know, how we approach business relationships, including money negotiations. Wow. That, okay. So thank you so much for, for – because I, I – get it. I mean, I get when you talk about it and you explain that, I, I get that completely. And the thing about, you know, men being able to beat each other up on a soccer field and then go have a beer together, boy, I, you just, you know, it, it is an interesting, they really do compartmentalize, which seems to me why they're less emotional uh, in, in many spheres, but especially in business, where, you know, one of my favorite things to say to my clients, and when I think about it, usually my female clients, is there's no, the only emotion that is valuable is passion. Other, anything else you really have to remove from the equation because it makes you make decisions or communicate in a way that is not in your best interest. And it feels to me like when men and women really get involved in negotiating, emotion gets in there. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I think, you know, because our relationship with money is often um, an emotional topic, uh, that emotion is in there. And what I would add to what you're saying is the fact that, you know, if you are 
anxious going into a negotiation, if you are feeling uncomfortable, not to think that, that there's something wrong with that. Just know that's great. That means you're on a growing edge. That means you're doing something new. Yeah. And when yeah. you do something new, you know this as a coach, when you do something new, often our anxiety increases before it goes down. It's not a reason yeah. to say, oh, I can't do this. It's a reason to go, oh, I'm on to something. Let's right. delve into this. Because chances are you will survive the 45, 50-minute meeting, and you will get to the other side. No matter what it looks like, you will live through it. That's right. That fight That's or flight is a primitive us. response. Nobody's going to really hurt you. Um, and so it's just reminding yourself of that. And then, you know, I teach both men and women, you know, sometimes you need to deep breathe. You need to visualize. You need to think about um, how you can be as calm as possible in that situation until you have enough situations where no longer do you get into that high anxiety state. It eventually right. goes away with practice. Oh, it's really great. What's the worst thing that can happen, Diane? They say no. They say no. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It doesn't kill you. Right. No, and you it really doesn't. It that doesn't feel so good, but it's okay. If you sometimes no helps you get to the right client. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, I feel like I'm um, sort of recapping, but uh, actually, and it's because this may sound like I'm asking you to repeat something, and it's not really. I just want to make sure I really understand that. When it comes to negotiating money as opposed to negotiating other things, negotiating money is harder, right? In general. We can't I in mean general. in general people find it more difficult because it there's an emotional undertone okay. that we all have relative to money that isn't okay. there. Right, with other things that, that seem to be I mean, if you're negotiating salary, fee, usually it taps into something around your livelihood, who you are in the world. Some people, um, you know, unfortunately tie their income to their self-worth, so then it becomes right. your worth in the world. It, and then if you have a family, you know, there can also be, um, you know, just are you a good provider? So all of this stuff is kind of swirling around while you're negotiating a contract or saying, you know, I deserve X amount for this particular project. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna hang does on that make that. sense? Absolutely, it makes perfect okay. sense. I just want to make sure because, you know, it can get. Um, we can talk about negotiating in general, and then we can talk about negotiating um, for with money involved. And I, I think negotiating in general is somewhat difficult. But then when you add the whole money thing into it, you know, it can get uh, even more. And I and I get it that it's because of all of that emotion and all of those other things that can be tied into money for for an individual. So um, let's talk about the common negotiating mistakes that business owners make, because I, I think what you had five that seem to be the most common. Sure, and these these can relate in general as well as money. They're, they're okay. more specific to money just because I'm a wealth psychology, psychology yeah. expert, and that's just where I come from. But the yeah. first thing that I see a lot of times when an entrepreneur will come to me for some wealth coaching around this topic is that they haven't researched their market or their client. So yeah. they're trying to figure out what their fee is only based on what they would pay or – just some guess of what might work, as opposed to doing the research of, okay, who are my competitors, where do I, where do I want to be in that price range, and how do I um, position myself and, and get the value there so my clients are going to see it, or how do I go after the clients who are going to see this fee as you know reasonable? Um, often, what I find is people want to make more money, but then they're going after the wrong clientele that is never right. going to pay them that fee or vice versa. And I think, you know, you have to do your research, not to say that you have to be priced just like the person next to you, but you do want to know, am I positioning myself as the cheap alternative, the middle of the road, or the creme de la creme? And depending on your industry, there's pros and cons to either. The quickest example I can give you is a divorce attorney. If you go uh -huh. and interview a divorce attorney and they say I'm 100 bucks an hour, and then there's another one you interview, and they say they're 500 bucks an hour. Off the top of your head, who do you think you want to hire? The $500. You want to hire the $500 an hour because he <laughs> sounds like, he or she sounds like they are more experienced. We have no idea. But right. your clients do the exact same thing. So you really need to do that market research and figure out how you want to position yourself. So that's number one. Wow, okay. Okay. 
Number yep. two has to do with negotiating. Don't negotiate price, negotiate value. And it sounds like you teach your sales folks how to do this all the time. Right. You don't want to be, you know, arguing over $5 here or there. You really want to say to somebody, this is the value I'm going to provide. I'm a keynote speaker. I go out and I speak to large groups of financial services professionals and business owners. There are a lot of people who do it for free. That is fine. That is their business model. It's different. I charge. And so I have to go into that negotiation being pretty clear that my value add is education, my value add is this, that. And so my client is able to go, oh, this is why I want to sink some money into having Kathleen Burns Kingsbury speak as opposed to having somebody over here speak for free. Once again, not right or wrong, but you need to know how to sell your value. And I didn't add this, believe in your value. Ah. And that's just the hardest part. And I say to my clients and my um, consultants uh, all the time, you know, why would I pay you if you don't believe in it? Like why would you pay your value if you are not buying it? You know, I'm 150 an hour. Versus, you know, I'm 150, and let me tell you why. Boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? Yep. So yep. really that believing piece is what I work on a lot with people because often it ties to old money stuff. Um, so Truly. That's and I, yep. Yeah, and I think that one is huge. I mean, absolutely oh. huge because it, 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 it gives you the opportunity. Well, it gives you strength. It, you know, it gives you that foundation to be able to say, this is what I'm charging and feel good about it, which is, is one of the biggest problems people have. It's one of the biggest problems, you know, especially service providers have. I think it's easier when oh, you're selling yeah. a product because you can add it up. But Well, wow. the other thing is you have to not only feel good about selling it and selling it at that value, you have to feel good enough about yourself that when they say no, it's okay. Yeah, great and, point. And that, that's the hardest part, I think. I, I worked with one woman recently, and this happens a lot of times, but her – situation comes to mind where no meant she was rejected and no meant that she wasn't worthy and the more we went into the psychology of what no meant of course she didn't want to get out and ask for money because it sounded like such a miserable experience we actually within an hour we were able to help her look at no differently what are the other ways and the other perspectives about hearing no from a client and when she was able to do that it freed her up and so she's able to go out and negotiate. Is it perfect? No, there's probably more work to be done. But right. it, it's all that stuff about what gets stirred up and how do you just examine it enough to move forward. You know, this isn't an in-depth therapy, but this is examining it enough to move forward. And our value is often a key one. I agree with you. It's it's so true. It's And, you know, one of the things that I say to my clients is, listen, you don't want to work with the people who don't see value in, in what you're doing because – they're never going to be happy, and they're not going to refer you, and they're not going to give you a testimonial, and you're going to spend a lot more time with them, making less money, but spending more time with them than you are with the people who you should be working with. So well, you should what welcome I love, them now. Yeah, and what I love is the belief, because I used to have this, so I can say this, the belief that if I just provide really high-quality services, this person will change their mind. And no way. Pay more. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't work that way after being it on really for doesn't. 18 years. Yeah. Nope. Nope. <laughs> it's a beautiful thought. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have any basis in reality. Right. It doesn't. Right. They're never happy. Ah, so yeah. that's a great, great, great point. So, okay. And uh, number three. Number three is, and everybody hears this, and I will reiterate it. You know, don't focus on the features of what you do. Focus on the benefits. So don't say, I meet with someone for, I'll meet with you for an hour. Feature. doesn't mean much to your client. What they want to hear is, in an hour, you'll feel more comfortable with money. Benefit. More right. comfortable with money. And this is where the active listening comes in. The more you actively listen and inquire and get curious about, what does my prospect or client really want? Like, what are the things in their lives that they want different? then you're able to tie in how this is going to benefit them. And it's not that you're being unethical or you're lacking integrity. What you're doing is really just trying to get to what is it exactly that they want. And sometimes you position yourself and let them know you can solve that. And sometimes you go, you know, I really think you're looking for something else. And then you help them connect with something else 
which is a value add, and they will remember you. So, you know, it's not always the short sale. Sometimes it's the longer process of just really being clear as to what your value is and what is your benefit to them. Uh, and that's hard to articulate. I think working with sales coaches and, and folks like mm-hmm. you is really helpful in that area because that, that's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. And it's funny, I used to sell copiers, and uh, copiers have a lot of features. But um, I, And that's why I always use the example that, you know, you can't just walk in and talk about all the features. It's what you just said about you have to be actively listening and hear what it is they need and then talk about how – this piece of equipment can benefit them for what they need. They don't care about all the bells and whistles. They don't care about all the things that you were told in your sales meeting you should be talking to people about. They care about what matters to them, what can help them solve their problem. And Well, and, and I know if I bought a copier, I, I would love to say it would be for the bells and whistles, but I would buy according to who that salesperson was and if they were going to yep. be servicing it, if I liked them and I felt they were trustworthy, which really has yep. very little to do with the copier. That's true. That's see. That's exactly right. That's right. Exactly right. So it's benefit. I'm I'm with you a, a million percent. It's it's, and all these things tie in together. You know, when you know what your value is, uh, I think you're stronger and more able to listen to what the other person is saying instead of trying to force feed, and convince you know and persuade the other person that because you're sort of trying to convince yourself at the same time. That, that you are that thing. When you really know your value, you can listen very attentively and hear what the person needs. And I love what you just said about if you can't help them, you'll be able to tell them, and you can refer them to somebody else, which definitely at, you know elevates you in their eyes because you're trustworthy. Right, and it feels good. I mean, I like helping people, yep. so it feels good. Yep. If I'm not the right fit, then it would feel better to refer them on. Um, now, you know what's interesting about that, too, is that I think it, it would be easier for people to enter a negotiation if they knew that there was the possibility that they weren't going to want to move forward. Oh, Do yeah. you know what it's I mean by like that? A, yes. It's like when you go for a job interview, it, and it's – when you go for a job interview, usually as an interviewee, you think, oh, I have to sell myself, as opposed to, I have to sell myself, but I also have to figure out, is this a company I want to work with? Exactly. Same thing in negotiations when you're, when you're an entrepreneur or a business owner. It's really about the match. It's not about, um, you know, some people get caught up in landing the deal, and that's fine, but I think ultimately yeah. it's a much better strategy to be, are we a good match, and if so... How do we make it work so both of us are getting the value we deserve? Right, right, exactly. Okay, wonderful. And you know what? Um, I, what? Go, go ahead. ahead. The fourth tip, it, it, I yeah. want to say two things because I'm going to combine one because something just came to mind. The okay. fourth tip that I have for people is don't mind read. We go into meetings and we assume <laughs> that we know, like I just don't, you know, I know my client won't pay that. Well, how do you know? You know, yeah. if you have it, so get out of their heads. That is your own money thoughts and beliefs. That's your own money strip. So stop mind reading. And the other piece that I'm going to add, it doesn't exactly fit, but it came up from your last um, comment, is it's okay to go in and at the end of a negotiation end with a maybe. You know, let me think about it. Let me have 24 hours. Let me. And anybody you're going to work with is going to allow you time. And if they don't allow you time, then chances are they may not be somebody you want to work with. Maybe is so powerful yeah well perfect wonderful well before we get to the fifth tip i just uh, want to remind everyone that today's show is sponsored by win cleveland and vision 21 you can visit www.wincleveland.org to learn more about the networking opportunities for women in northeast ohio and www.vision21.org for details on how you can utilize the resources at vision 21 to grow your business And for those of you in the chat room, if you have something you'd like to say or a question you'd like to ask, you can type it into the chat room, and I will share it with our guest, Kathleen. And if you're on the phone and you have something you want to say, you can press 1, and that will let me know you want to participate, and we'll get you on the air. Okay, number five. Last but not least, know when to be quiet. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm giggling because I am just highly verbal. So I learned this one from my husband, God love him, who has 15 years of sales experience. Ah. And when I first got out doing my own negotiations, I said, you know, what what can you tell me? Like, what should I do? He goes, state your praise and just be quiet. He goes, you really, with all due respect, have to shut up. 
And I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. And it's great advice, and it's so hard. And the reason yeah. it's so hard is when we're emotional, especially women, but yeah. when we get emotional, we tend to talk too much. You know, so you say, you know, that'll be, I don't know, that'll be $3,000 for this package. Yeah. And then, then we're like, but if you blah, 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 and you want to redo it, <laughs> no, 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 no. 3000 and if you have to bite your lip, if you have to write 20 times in front of you, be quiet, be quiet, just yeah. sit with whatever you're feeling and let the other person take in what you just said. Yeah. People hate silence. It brings up feelings, and when you're negotiating, especially money, there's lots of feelings, not only for you. The other thing is there's feelings for the person that you're negotiating with. They're probably not aware of what their money scripts are, what their thoughts are. And so if you sit with the silence a little bit, um, it just allows people to take it in, and you're not going to automatically say something from an emotional place. You're going to wait and say something from a place that's a little bit more wise. You know, it's it's not all your rational mind, but, uh, you know, more of your rational mind than your emotional mind. And, you know, interestingly, I find that – now, I did um, one really fabulous negotiation a number of years ago where I I jokingly said I was channeling my father because I was really quiet, which isn't like me either, and um, real quiet. And what it allowed me to do was respond instead of react. Mm, yep, and made a huge difference in how the and and I was detached, so I wasn't emotional at all while I was in there. A no was fine with me, you know. I was prepared that I may not be able to get what I wanted, and and having a no and walking out the door was just fine. So I think I was more open to um, hearing what the other person was saying, but also responding to what they were saying in a way that was best for me. You know, I could give a good response because I was able to think. Yes, and it's just it's slowing the whole thing down. And, and we yeah. I think there's a belief that if somehow, you know, we're a good negotiator if we always know what we're going to say on the top of our minds. But really, more often than not, good negotiators sit with silence, figure it out. And even if you need to say, you know, I need to take a minute, that's okay. Right. You know, it's much better to have a thoughtful response than a response that's in relation to being emotionally flooded because that's just going to come from your old money stuff, and it's more often than not not going to be useful. Right, right, right. Okay, so these are fabulous. So um, then do you have some practical tips for how people can avoid these mistakes? Yes. Actually, what I designed just to make it simpler for people is what I call the ABCs of creating wealth from the inside out. So basically, it's a system that helps people work through this process. And I describe it in my workbook as well as in my audio. So A stands for accept. The first thing you need to do is identify and then accept what your thoughts and beliefs are about money. And until you figure out what the chatter is in your head, until you make that more overt, it's hard to change anything. So okay. that's the first step. And, um, you know, this can you can do this in a variety of different ways. Um, one of the ways you can do it is to answer some quick statements top of mind. I'll give you three to, just to give you an example. Okay. And what comes up is what's usually a money script. So if you were to complete the sentence, uh, wealthy people are, Whatever pops to your mind, you don't necessarily need to answer, but just somebody out there in the listening audience, wealthy people are, and you just complete it. Okay. The next one is, talking about money is. (laughs) See, you're already tapping into something. (laughs) I wrote uncomfortable. (laughs) That's the first word that came to my mind. Okay. Right? And then, people who love money are. Oh. So, I mean, I have a host and a host of these. In fact, you can – I believe I have some in my blog. If you go to oh, great. Uh, my website at kbkwealthconnection.com and go on the blog, you can kind of search. Um, and from time to time, I, I ask these different questions to get people to think about it. But that's the first step. You need to tap into what is actually going on in your head. You know, often people will come up with talking about money is rude or uncomfortable or yucky, and then it's looking at, well, why do I think that, and how is that helping me in business, and how is that getting in the way? And so that's the really big first step of how to feel more comfortable uh, negotiating 
uh, in avoiding these uh, mistakes that people make. Okay. The next piece is B, stands for believe, and we've already talked a fair amount about this, but you really yeah. need to believe in your value and to believe in yourself. And so when you have a certain amount of self-worth and self-worth around money, which can be a little bit different, then you're able to go into these negotiations knowing whether it works out or not, you will be fine because another business deal will come, wealth will come in a different way if it doesn't work out, and if it works out, great. And so if you truly believe in your value, then you're able to communicate it, then you're able to ask for it, and ultimately you will attract and work with people who will pay you it. And while it all sounds hokey, because, you know, I I used to be that really rational person going, well, that's hokey, um, (laughs) or that's woo-woo, right? So I've been there. Um, I have practiced it in my life, and it it works. You know, I was, like, surprised. I was like, wow, this actually works. And, you know, you can be incredibly self-confident in a variety of different ways and accomplished and still not be very confident in believing in your monetary value. They can be two different things. Ah, so you really okay. need to work on what does money mean to you, what does wealth mean to you, and how um, do you believe you should receive wealth in life. Okay. And the last huh. is C for create. You need to then, after you accept your money history, you learn to believe in yourself and your value, you need to create opportunities to receive wealth. We cannot just sit around and wait for people to pay us money. We need to go out and ask for it. And we need to figure out creative ways in which we can receive not only financial wealth, um, but non-financial wealth. And by that I mean support of loved ones, you know, other things in our life that aren't necessarily um, monetary, but make us or lead us to living a wealthy life. Fascinating. Okay. So, wow, I love that. And I don't, you know, of course, I do this, but I don't really see that as woo-woo. For me, that has real strong foundational um, value. You know, it's not up there in the clouds in the air because uh, it's what helps you succeed in business overall. Yeah, I think. I think my gift, actually, to be honest with you, is I've always been really good at being a bridge between worlds. So there's the the world of psychology and alternative stuff, and then there's the world of business and, you know, the market I'm in, financial services. And often they they see themselves as very separate, but there's so much they can learn from each other. And I really feel like, you know, one of the things that I'm able to do that I actually enjoy doing is bridging between the two. So I'm glad you don't see it as woo-woo. as a coach, it sounds like you see it you see it in your own coaching practice and in your own business life that it's, it's yeah. useful to go through this these three steps it It's invaluable. I mean, I think everyone should be going through this because and I'm real practical, you know I'm a real you know I can only live in reality, won't you join me here kind of gal and so for me, this is all practical stuff you you have to own your value or no one else is going to it's something you said before you know if you're not confident no one else is going to be and they're not going to hire you you know and and why are you doing it i mean if you don't think you can do a good job why are you even trying to sell it to anybody you know i I could take that road a million times um and and you know people go into business to be successful there's nothing wrong with that there's it i think this I guess, goes around the money script, right? That there's nothing yes. wrong with earning a living for the thing, for the value that you bring. And if you look at certain professions, I agree with you, but look at certain professions, and there's actually a culture around that. The easiest one to point out is the helping professions. Yeah. So think about your counselors, your educators, um, sometimes your doctors, but all that culture often has the belief that, you know, we're helping and we're servicing and we love what we do, so we really, you know, getting wealthy is not something we want. And yeah. it's not conscious, but, boy, it's there. I've, I've lived in the healthcare environment before I was in um, speaking and coaching, and it's strong. And so what ends up happening is you start to feel as if I'm doing something wrong as opposed to, no, this might be a progression in my professional life of wanting to – Uh, ask and get paid what I'm worth because it feels good and it's okay to be paid well when you do a good job. And I will go as far as to say when you're paid well, you show up differently than when you're underpaid. 
Yeah, and that's interesting. People have given me lots of pushback on that, but I got to tell you, I show up much different for a five thousand dollar engagement than I do for a fifty dollar engagement. Um, it's just the truth of the matter. I think that's a great point, and I agree with you. I think people can deny it all they want, but um, you know, I and and interesting. I mean, I know someone who. Um, had a friend who provided a service, and the friend said, well, you know what, I'll give you the friends and family rate, and then did not provide the same level of service that they did to their full-paying clients. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. You're going to offer a lower rate. You're offering it to provide the same high cl- you know, high-level performance, or don't offer it, you know, right. or say, I'm going to give you friends and family, but this is what you're going to get for it. You know, right, to be very clear about it because it's okay It's okay to change up the deliverables. It's okay yeah. to do it differently. But you have to be clear, and often what I think happens is the business owner isn't clear. It's like yeah. an emotional decision. How can I charge my sister-in-law this? Right. You know, so you reduce it, and then all of a sudden you end up thinking, oh, I'm hardly making anything on this contract. Yeah. Well, I'll just do a little less. And, you know, it just snowballs into something where typically people end up unhappy. Um, yeah. As opposed to, you could even give them an option. Do you want the full service or do you want the friend and family, which is less? And and let this is the mind reading thing. Let the client decide. You right. may be surprised. Often we guess wrong. We just guess what we would pick, not what our client would pick. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, so so you help people really identify what their money personality is. Right, so they know where they're coming from in regards to more money in general, but you know how they're negotiating fees and contracts and things like that. Right, basically how we think and feel about money, and then there's actually some money personality tests that I can either administer, or give, or direct people towards um, that you know help them understand even more, and it helps you. Professionally, it also helps you personally, and it can help you in your partnership, whether that's a business partnership or a couplehood, because we all have money personalities that are formed between age 5 and 14. doesn't mean you can't change it, but think about it. It's formed in your childhood years. You're Mm -hmm. operating with those sets of beliefs, and, you know, they may serve you if it's the right combination for your field and your life and where you're at, or they might, you know, get in the way. So I help people kind of identify the pieces that are getting in the way and amplify the things that are working. You know, how do you do more of that? Interesting. All right, so if we have someone who is listening to this and they're thinking to themselves, I have no idea what my money personality is, can they, is there a way to sort of look back at negotiations that have not gone well to um you know start to ident- you know can can I like can I look back at a negotiation that didn't go well and really sort of backtrack and go through it and try and figure out where I derailed or yeah that actually I love people- that I love that idea I haven't done it I do that with clients I think one on one but I haven't thought of that as actually a an assignment somebody could do if you were to think about the last time you negotiated and whether it worked or it didn't like how, whatever yeah. you feel about it and you just write out the you know write out the script or the story and how did it happen how did you feel what did you think what did you say kind of try to get all the information down and then you can go back and you can start to look at especially in what you thought uh, or what you communicated, yeah. you can go back and you can pick up on what's a money belief, what's a money script. And so often when you're looking for a money script or a money belief, which are interchangeable words, you are looking for something that tends to be a little bit black and white, um, something that tends to not apply in every situation um, and and tends to be a little extreme. I'll give you an example from my own Great. life. For the longest time, I didn't even know I had this money script, but I would go out and do these presentations when I was working in the counseling field. I would go out. I would work at a corporation. It was maybe two hours of my time. It was really easy. I enjoyed it. Nothing was painful. It wasn't hard. And at the time, I was paid better than I was paid to be sitting in my office seeing clients. And I never felt good about it. I was like, oh, this is boring. This isn't thumbs off which is ironic because I become a corporate speaker. So what, <laughs> in looking back, what, what it was for me is that I had a collapsed belief. I had a belief that in order to 
um, work and have meaningful work, it had to be hard and it had to be painful. You oh. had to suffer. I am a, I, you know, Irish Catholic upbringing. You have to <laughs> suffer. Right. <laughs> I was not suffering enough. Uh. And so when I, it was interesting because that came to me one day. I mean, you can't do this type of work with other people and not have your own stuff right. ongoing. Right. right. So I, I looked at it and I went, oh. And since then, when I go to an engagement and I have, like I just spoke at a conference on Monday in Chicago, I had a blast. I met the greatest men and women. I had a really good time. You know, I got a lot of engagements off, you know, out of it. Yeah. And instead of thinking, oh, something's wrong here, I thought, how wonderful. I get to be paid well, do good work. It's great. And it's fun. So it, it's, it, I do think going back and looking at what are the patterns, yeah. what are the consistent things you say to yourself. And sometimes you can do that yourself. I think my workbook can help somebody. I also think that working with any coach, if the coach knows enough to ask about the money, can really be helpful right. as well. Right. All right. Well, that brings – I was going to ask you a question about, you know, what sorts of resources are available for, for you know, anyone who wants to be better at negotiating if they really feel like they're falling down in, in this area. Sure. Let me offer two books in general, and then right. I can tell you a little bit about my book. Um, okay. Women Don't Ask is a great book out there by Linda uh, Babcock, I believe. Uh, Research-oriented is obviously specifically for women, but really highlights why it's such a tricky thing for women to negotiate. Great. Old school. This is a really old book, but it's good and it's really small. So if you're like me and you like an easy read, Win-Win Negotiations, great book. Great. Who's it by? Do you, know, do you remember? Um, don't remember, but okay. it's so popular, it'll pop right up if you put it in Google. Great. Or we can get okay. that information out to them later. Um, the other um, thing is that my workbook isn't particularly about negotiation. What it's about is the ABC system. So it could, it will take you through the process um, in a self-help manner of figuring out how do you accept your money scripts, believe in yourself, and create opportunities to receive wealth in your life. You could do it alone. You could do it with a coach. You could do it with a therapist. Um, and, you know, I actually have a sale going on. I think it's $15, including shipping, which is incredibly low, uh, for July 4th because I wanted more and more people to feel financially independent or free to accept money in their life. So that's the Oh, way. how great. And they can yeah. get that on your site, on your website? Yep. You just go to kbkconnections.com. And uh, it's all lined up. You can order through PayPal there. If you prefer to use credit card and do that whole deal, you can go through Amazon. Um, I don't have the same deal on Amazon, but they right. mark it down a bit, so it shouldn't be too, too bad. Okay, i got a question for you. Because before I sure. had KBK Wealth Connections, and now I have no KBK app. Connections. No I'm sorry. No app. KBK, and is it KBK Wealth Connection. Okay, great. Okay, Wealth. Oops. Okay, great. I'm writing it in the chat room, so those folks have it. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Wow, that, that is really, um, really great. And so while we're on the subject, uh, tell the audience, you know, how they really, you know, they can learn more about your work and um, other than your workbook, if you're going to, are you speaking anywhere? Uh, Probably the best, yeah. you know, the two things. That's a good question. The best thing to do is to visit my website at kbkwealthconnection.com. For most of your audience, what's going to ring true probably is my blog. I try okay. to do it every Tuesday, Thursday, video blog, written blog, all about these concepts. I would love to have people comment and say what they want to hear more about. Um, right. The other place that they can go if they want to see where I'm speaking that's open to the public because um, sometimes I do corporate stuff that isn't open to the public. You want right. to go to my Amazon site. All you do is go to Amazon, uh, Amazon, excuse me, and type in "creating wealth from the inside out." It'll bring you to Kathleen Burns Kingsbury author page, and I have my assistant update where I'm speaking and where it's open to the public um, across the United States uh, as as we book them. So. Um, right. You might want to check back from time to time because I would love to say, "Hey, you know, heard you on the radio, and here I am." I would love people yeah. to come and introduce themselves. That'd be neat. Absolutely. Okay, if you had, well, I'll give you three. One to three. <laughs> you don't have to use all three, but if you had one to three, um, you know, pearls of wisdom that you wanted to leave the audience with when they are thinking about their next negotiation, what would they be? 
let's see. The first would be spend time understanding and building your relationship with money. Ah, good. The second one would be to find somebody, it doesn't matter if it's a coach, a friend, a husband, a partner, to talk a little bit about your relationship with money and specifically negotiations, to just talk it through with somebody. Okay. And the last one would be to figure out, and it's going to be different for everybody, but to figure out how you can have fun negotiating. Because ah. once you embrace that this is a, 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 a fun or an enjoyable part of your job, it, it just gets so much better. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be this dreaded thing. It can, it, if it, it can't be fun for you, I get it, then at least it can be enjoyable. Um, because when you start to be effective negotiator and you start and you have peace with your relationship with money, I got to tell you, it takes a lot of stress out of your day to day as a business owner. Boy, it sounds like. I mean, it, it really. I'm I'm listening to it. I'm thinking, um, this whole idea of you know that we have a relationship with money. I think most people ignore because they just don't know how to shift it or you know how to change it. Which is why I think this has been so valuable. Uh, and that your workbook, you know, everyone should be getting your workbook because working th- th- there's so much value in working through it and getting to the other side. Right. And it's it's actually, you know, it's not such an overwhelming thing. I've seen people work through the workbook or have a couple of sessions and, you know, make a big difference in how they feel negotiating or attend yeah. a workshop and, and say, you know what, I tried some of that and I do feel better. And I think yeah. if we just all start talking about it more openly, the uh-huh. taboo will be decreased and we can all just do a better job taking care of ourselves and each other. So um, here was a question I wanted to ask you before and I forgot, so I'm going to ask you now because you just said something that prompted me. Is the American culture different than other cultures when it comes to relationships with money or, or you know, money beliefs, better, worse, or, or we're all just, you know, the human condition is the same? Well, it's interesting. I, I do think it's different from culture to culture. Um, I know that certainly in our consumer-driven culture, we always believe more is better, more stuff, more money, more, 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 and that can, you know, lead us into trouble with spending um, not saving, maybe, you know, negotiating in a way that isn't necessarily useful for our life or our business. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to hedge that with it, it'll be interesting to see what happens because as the world becomes more global, yeah. um, it'll be interesting to see how that shifts and changes. But I have worked with people from different cultures, and it can even be a different religious background where they have uh, different thoughts and beliefs about money than, you know, your traditional consumer-driven American, for lack of a better word, has. So it's really um, exploring that for you and looking at all those different pieces and also, you know, appreciating where your client's coming from as well. Um, right. So it does shift and change. I'm not going to say it's better or worse. Um, I do think our culture can be a little tricky around money, um, but it is what it is. So it's uh, identifying it and figuring out how you can move forward uh, the way you need to move forward for your own uh, peace of mind and success of your business. Wow, great point. Great, great point. Thank you so much. And really, thank you for joining us today and sharing all this information. It it was uh, I know for me, invaluable. I learned an awful lot and um, and realized, you know, some things about my relationship with money uh, just in this hour. So, um, and I'm I'm sure the same is true for all of our listeners. Um, I will remind our listeners to visit WinCleveland.org and Vision21.org to learn more about today's sponsors. And please uh, go to Kathleen's uh, website at KBK Wealth Connection. Dot com and visit her blog where she has a lot of information. Uh, you can buy her workbook on sale um, through July 4th, uh, an incredible deal. I'm going there right when the show ends, and I'll be buying mine. Uh, <laughs> I'll beat you there. Actually, probably half the people have already gone and bought it, but that's okay. Uh, our next show will be on July 11th uh, when my guest will be Ryan Hardy of the Intuitive Marketing Group. And Ryan is going to talk with us about digital marketing strategies and SEO and all that stuff none of us understand, but we need to know in this new um, economy. Uh, Please note that you can mark the show as a favorite, so you are um, provided with uh, 
notifications of upcoming shows, so you can be sure to be joining us. And uh, we were talking about sales a little earlier, and if you find yourself struggling with the sales process, uh, please feel free to pick up a copy of Lemonade Stand Selling at barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com. Have a great couple of weeks. Have a safe 4th of July, and we will see you all again on July 11th. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Do you love news about LinkedIn, Indeed, Google, and just about every other recruitment tech company out there? Hell yeah. I'm Chad. I'm Cheese. We're the Chad and Cheese Podcast. All the latest recruiting news and insights are on our show. Dripping in snark and attitude. Subscribe today wherever you listen to your podcasts. We We out. out.